Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mr. Ebrex. All right, I know the question on everybody's mind. Mr. Ebright, are you done with the essays? The answer is I have four left. You're in the final four. You're in the final four because you guys are the last ones to do it. And then there's two left. I haven't put any in the grade book yet. I'm going to wait to put them all in at the same time. So uh, I respect the board. Can we go out to the hallway? I'm sorry, what? Can we get ours? No. No. Um, I will tell you this. I did give a 40 out of 40, which is very rare. Okay. So congratulations to that person. You don't know who you are yet. Uh, we're so far as 32 out of 40. Okay. I think I know who that is. I mean, it's hard to get in the 20s. But it's possible. <laughs> we'll see, John. Hey, hey, you can't not like mine. Okay? Okay. That's good. Like, that's fine. Joe Montana. Oh, uh, we got Joe Montana. Uh, you? Irrelevant. Okay. <laughs> Yesterday we were talking about. <laughs> Friday we were talking about Virginia Plant, which was written by James Madison. The New Jersey Plan. And then they voted, and they didn't get nine votes. So we came up with the great compromise. And so what that looks like, again, guys, this is dealing with the legislature, okay, with the House of Representatives and the Senate, okay, two each here. And this was chosen by state legislatures, right? And then here, the House of Representatives, chosen by the people. And the House is based on what? Population. So the more people you have in your state, the more members of the House you have. So right now, if you look back at this uh, Electoral College map, notice that California has 55 electoral college votes. How many members of the House does California have? Subtract two senators. They have 53 members of the House. This is the most populated state in the Union. Okay, These states with only three electoral college votes, how many members of the House do they have? One, and you are guaranteed one, okay, by the Constitution, no matter the size of your state, okay? So, um, before these these were all states out here in the West, they were what first? Territories, okay? And in order for a territory to become a state, you had to have a certain number of people that lived in that territory. Remember this number? Bam! Sarah coming out with 60,000. That's right, 60,000, okay? And you had to have a state constitution that was representative in matter. So, like, you had to be able to elect your state government, okay? Representative government, okay? So, now, today, how many members of the U.S. House of Representatives are there? Sarah? 435. 435. Okay, we're all going to play this game. Are you ready? I'm going to ask you how many members of the United States House of Representatives are, and you're all going to reply 435. You ready? How many members are there in the United States House of Representatives? 435. How many members are there in the United States House of Representatives? 435. Yeah. Okay. Now, the original Senate had how many? 26, 13 states times 2 is 26. This is doing math in government class. It's called cross-curricular learning. Okay. Now, today we have 50 states, 2 each. How many senators are there? 100. 
Each star represents state. 50. Okay. Now, now, how many members are there in Congress? 535 members of Congress. Okay. Today. The first house, that's what you're going to ask. The first house at 65. Now you can ask your question, John. Why is Nebraska dumb? Why is Nebraska the only state that has a unicameral government? Is that what you're asking? No, why is it like, is that why their votes are different? Oh, up there? Why is it well, like, different? Like for like presidential, because it's like they get- like, Okay, like, you're making me or... talk about things I shouldn't be talking about. Yeah. Okay, so in 48 of the 50 states, it's winner take all. So if you win 51% of the popular vote in Kansas, you get all six electoral college votes. You win 51% of the popular vote in California, you win all 55 electoral college votes. This has gone Democrat ever since 1988. 1988 was the last time a Republican candidate won California. Okay, that was George Herbert Walker Bush, the first one. Okay, now Nebraska and Maine, it's not winner take all. So they have five electors, which means they have three members of the House, two senators. Maine has two senators and two members of the House based on population. They draw five districts for their presidential election. Each one is divided up by population. And the one that is around the college campus there in Lincoln always goes to the Democrat. And then the other four go to the Republicans almost every time. Okay, so Obama, this is 2012, Obama won one of the five. In Maine, he won all four districts. In 2016, Trump won one of the main districts. Uh oh, okay. Yeah, I don't know why they're stupid. Now, Nebraska, when we had 13 states, okay, the original 13. Pennsylvania was the only state that had a unicameral state legislature. Today we have 50 states, and Nebraska is the only state with a unicameral state legislature. In Topeka, we have a state house and a state senate. Nebraska only has one house. And Mrs. Lovelace's grandfather used to serve in that body. Pretty cool. Okay. This is the great compromise. Now, as we noticed, the difference here was the 17th Amendment, correct? The 17th Amendment gave us direct election of the senators by the people, of which nobody could name. Last Friday, were you here, Sarah? Huh? huh? Were you here Friday? Yeah. Did you know the two senators from Kansas? Marshall and Ryan. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So I was going to tell you, if you recall, I told you to tell me why we need to repeal the 16th and 17th Amendment. Because nobody. Okay. So, can I? Will you indulge me? Indulge me here. We're good? All right. Yeah? Okay. All right. So, does anybody know the 16th Amendment? Yet? It is the income tax. Uh, you don't have to. No. You don't have to. You don't have to, right? You don't have to in school. But you should. Okay. <laughs> no, it's not from a history book. Okay. This is from, um, as my wife calls it, a uh, cult. Okay. <laughs> Called a convention of the states. Okay. Now, 
couple of things here. Now, we're actually jumping ahead and are learning a little bit on this. Not too far, though. Okay. There's two ways to propose an amendment. There's two ways to ratify. Okay. We have 27 amendments total. Did I misspell something? Okay. We have 27 amendments total, yes? The first 10 are the Bill of Rights. All 27 amendments have been proposed by two-thirds majority of Congress. Yet the Constitution gives us another way to propose an amendment. It's called a National Convention of the States. Now, what is the Constitutional Convention that we're talking about right now but a National Convention of the States for the purposes of proposing a new Constitution, yes? Now, that's what a Convention of the States would look like. All 50 states, would, instead of 13, all 50 states would send delegates to a location for the purposes of proposing new constitutional amendments, in this case, a repeal of these two, or maybe a constitutional amendment proposing term limits on members of Congress. Now, would Congress, two-thirds of both houses, ever propose limits on their terms? No. So this is what this cult, my wife calls it, right? The Convention of the States group wants to call for a national convention for the purposes of proposing term limits for members of Congress. Right now, you can get elected to the House or Senate as many terms as you can get reelected. And many do. Do they not? Now, I used to be against this. I used to be against term limits because we want experienced people in Washington, people with wisdom, people that make good decisions for the country. Now, I'm cynical as hell, and I want to throw the bums out. I don't want them to be there for 30 years. I don't want them to be there for 40 years, or in some people's cases, 50 years. Okay? You look at the leadership of Congress today, Mitch McConnell, Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, they've all been there 36 years or longer. They are swamp creatures. You go to Washington, guys, you go to Washington like, and, and I'm, I'm going to run and I'm going to go to Washington, I'm going to fix and solve the problems facing my community, my state, my district. I'm going to represent my constituents. I'm going to go fix things. Yeah. And then you get consumed by the swamp. And you change. Okay. Okay. You learn how the system really works. Okay. As you will learn, guys, as we get into this more, the Speaker of the House, whether it's a Democrat or a Republican, are like dictators over the House. The Speaker is like a dictator. In the Senate, nothing happens in the Senate unless Mitch McConnell, or excuse me, Chuck Schumer, who's the Senate Majority Leader, wants it to happen. Nothing happens unless the leaders want it to. They are like dictators. Okay? Now, so this is why people are calling for a convention of the states. Now, they won't talk about this out loud publicly, the Convention of the States crowd, because I joined and I'm like, hey, we need to repeal the 16th and 17th Amendment. They're like, yeah, I know. Shh. Shh. We need the term limits first. Okay. So, everybody follow me where we're at right now? Okay. Okay. Before these two things together changed our nation. Okay, prior to the income tax, and, and any of you guys had a legitimate job where you had taxes taken? Okay. Prior to the income tax, you had no relationship one-on-one -on -one with the federal government. The only way you had a relationship with the federal government is if you were in the armed services 
or you worked for the post office, or you worked in Washington, D.C. for the federal government. That was the only people that had a relationship with the national government. The income tax creates a personal relationship between you and Uncle Sam. So prior to the income tax, states were taxed based on their population. So the more people your state had, the more your state paid in taxes. Now, who gets to decide how much people pay in taxes? Who writes the tax laws? Who? The House, but the Senate has to pass those too, right? Okay, you with me now? So the ones that pass the tax laws that tells us how much we pay, okay, in part are the Senate. Stay with me here. The states, the state legislatures, get to choose the senators, right? So when they send the senators to Washington, they say, hey, look, you're going to be tasked with taxing our state. You need to take it easy now. If you want to go back to Washington, the state legislatures, the states, controlled the senators. They controlled who the senators were and what the senators did. Those senators had to look out for their states. We take away that relationship, okay? Now the federal government has a direct relation here. Now the people elect the Senate. And we don't even know who our senators are, and we have a direct relationship here, the Senate and the people. Who did we replace? We replaced the states with the people. Now that's more democratic, right? This is more democratic. This is more democratic. Did our founders create a democracy? No, they did not. They created a republic, a representative government, where the states got to choose the senators, not the people. There's no way in hell, guys, we would have $33 trillion in debt today if it were not for these two amendments. The states wouldn't allow it. The states would have more of a say. You cre create this illusion of democracy, okay? And what do, what do politicians do? They promise you the moon. They don't make tough decisions. They want to get reelected. So they promise you, and we run in debt, we run in debt, we run in debt. You guys with me? Follow that. Go online, look up Convention of the States. To this point, now two thirds of the states today is 34. Okay? You need 34 states to agree to do this. To ratify an amendment, you need three quarters of the states to agree to a new amendment. Okay? Now, some people say, no, we can't do this. You'll have a runaway convention where they start adding all these crazy ideas to the Constitution. Well, wait a second. You're not going to get a runaway convention if you've got to have three quarters of states to approve it. You know what I mean? If they come up with some crazy ideas, you know what I mean? It's not going to happen. Now, the chances of this ever happening, these ever being repealed, are like zero. You understand? Unless people are educated and they agree with it. Okay? But most people have no freaking clue what, what the hell's going on here. They say, well, it's more democratic. It must be good. Now, let me, you guys, uh, any of you guys think about going to Wichita State? 
I got that Distinguished Scholar program. Have you gone to that yet? Coming up, maybe next semester. Many of you guys go to that Distinguished Scholar thing at WSU. The way they used to do it is they put a group of students around a big round table, like eight students at a table. And then they give them a question to answer. And one year, I remember this very clearly, I had just talked about repealing the 17th Amendment. And the question they asked these students at Wichita State was about the 17th Amendment and its impact. And my students knew what the hell was going on. And they said, they came back to class on Monday. And they're like, Mr. Ebright, you won't believe what just happened. They asked us about the 17th Amendment. I got a $10,000 scholarship. Like two of them got $10,000 scholarships because I taught them about this. Yeah. So it's not a waste of time. Okay. Now, uh, they meet at Spangles every Wednesday night, the local chapter of the Convention of the States. Uh, to this point, Spangles. Spangles. 13, 13, maybe 14 states have agreed to do this. What, what's the state's agreement? That the the state or? agrees to send delegates to a national convention. Is that like the people voting that we agree to do? The state thing? legislature. State legislatures agrees to send out. I think we're up to 14 states. I guess I went to Topeka three years ago in support. This is where I got my button. <laughs> And I sat in on a House state House committee meeting on this subject of a national convention. And so we had the national speaker, a guy named Mark Meckler, came in and spoke in front of the state legislatures or the committee. And then they had people come in in opposition to it. And they talked about this runaway national convention where they come up with these crazy ideas and, and so forth. And I'm like, dude, come on, man. It's, it's got to be ratified by 38 states. It's not going to happen. Okay? You're not going to get a bunch of crazy ideas. Okay? But the big one that most people agree with is term limits. Okay? I, this, yeah, I mean, they don't really talk about this out loud. Okay? It's kind of like at the Second Continental Congress. They really didn't talk about independence for a long time, and then they did. Okay? So, uh, yeah. Right? This changed, this changed us a lot, these two amendments, okay? And this was in the 19 teens, uh, like 1913, we got the income tax, and then shortly thereafter, they went direct election with the senators to make us more democratic, which is always a good thing. Okay. What's the 27th amendment? 27th? Yeah. Uh, deals with congressional pay. Oh, and by the way, uh, right now they make 174000 By the way, the bill that was supposed to stop them from being able to buy stocks while they were in Congress, that it's died. It's, it's not going to pass this term. They're, they're about done. So the fiscal year ends this week. Um, Congress has like three more days in session before they go on fall break. Well, they, they're all running for re-election, so they got to go out and campaign over the next 35, 40 days. So they're going on recess. So I don't, I don't think, they did pass a, re, a continuing resolution to fund the government uh, through the new year. So you're saying if you're not up for re-election, they get a 40-day vacation? Pretty much. <laughs> That's okay. They're not spending more money. They have to vacate. <laughs> okay. All right. So, everybody got the. Uh, all right. You're going to write about the Virginia, New Jersey, and the Great Compromise. It ends there. Now, we've got some other compromises we got to deal with. We got to figure out, first of all, the executive branch. What are we going to do there? Are we going to have a parliamentary system? No. We're going to have a presidential system. Okay. So, the executive. What are we going to call it? What are we going to call the chief executive? What did, Jeff, what did Alexander Hamilton want to call him? King George. George Washington. He wanted to call him King, our first president. He wanted the, the executive to have a lot of power. 
Okay, but there was resistance to that. So the executive, yes, is going to be called president. And how long will they be elected? Four year terms. Is there any limit on the four year terms? Not at this time. Now, the next question is, how are we going to elect them? It's not going to be Congress. And so there's a big fight over this. Like some people say Congress should elect the president because they know what's going on. Others said, no, this should be a choice of the people. They said, no, are you kidding me? We don't trust the people. So they settled on what? The Electoral College. Holy crap, is that confusing. Again, guys, there's a theme here. And it goes back to the New Jersey plan as well. Guys, there's a fear that states are losing their sovereignty. States are losing their power. They had it all under the Articles. And under this new Constitution, states are really concerned that they're going to lose all their power and that they're going to be dominated by this person or by Congress. They're afraid. So they resist democracy, okay, and go with this instead. Now, today, how many members are there in the United States House of Representatives? Yeah, that was pretty lame. Okay, yeah, 435. How many senators are there? 100. Okay, that's 535, right? Now, is there a place in the United States where people live that is not a state? Okay, that's a territory in the contiguous United States. Washington, D.C. Now, do those people have electoral college votes? They don't have senators and representatives. They're not a state. Do they get to vote for president? Not till the 23rd Amendment. Talk about taxation without representation. People who live in D.C. are getting screwed. Besides I would. That point. <laughs> Besides that point. 23rd Amendment gives Washington, D.C. the same number of electors it would have if it were a state. Which they would have one based on population, two senators. Okay? So, what's the number? 538. That's the total number of electors on that map over there. You add up all those numbers. You get 538. Okay. Now, if you divide that in half, you get 269. You got to have a majority to win. That is the magic number. When you're running for president, your goal is to get 270 electoral college votes. You win. Everybody understand how that works? 48 states, it's winner take all. You get one more vote in Kansas than the other party, you get all six electoral college votes. Okay? Now, this is where some people get confused. Uh, that's not going to work. Let's be more accurate. All right, Kansas, yes, we have six, all right, four members of the House, two senators, everybody, yeah, you win 51%, you get all six, okay, so usually that's the Republican candidate in the state of Kansas, okay, so six Republican electors, cast their vote for president and vice president. So when you are voting for president and vice president, vote for them together. That's the 20. That's the 12th Amendment. Okay. You vote for them together, not separately. Okay. You're actually voting for six human beings, not the president and vice president. You're voting for six Republican or Democratic electors. These are actual human beings. The 
you guys ever uh, seen the TV show um, Antiques Roadshow on TBS? Oh, you poor children. Okay, good. Love that show. You like that show? Yeah, okay. What about Pawn Stars on I love Pawn Stars. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Stop it. Stop it. <laughs> on the Antiques Roadshow, this guy brought in a campaign poster from 1860. Who was running for president in 1860? Abraham Lincoln was. It didn't even have his name on it. It had the names of these electors. Any of you guys ever heard of Bob Dole? Bob Dole's a former senator, presidential candidate from Kansas, okay? He would be somebody that you would trust as a elector, as a Republican elector. He's a Republican senator. You could have governor, former governor of Kansas, Bob Graves, who's a former Republican uh, governor. He could be an elector. Okay, so you pick, each party picks six you know, lifelong Republicans or lifelong Democrats to be the electors. That's who you are actually voting for, a slate of six people from one of the parties. Those people cast the ballot, six votes for the president, vice president. And when you go vote, it says the name of the candidates. But you're not actually voting for them. You're voting for the electors. That's confusing, isn't it? Yeah. Did he say, uh, I'm a never Trumper and I am not voting for Trump? Yes. Has that happened before? Yes. At least 10 times in American history. Has it ever impacted the outcome of an election? No. Could it? Yes. It does. Look, if something came out between the election and inauguration before January 6th, that's when they count these votes, okay? Before January, it's between November and January 6th. If something came out, like Trump really did collude with the Russians. Didn't you know that? Like, he couldn't have won without the Russians. Like, they were colluding, they were giving him money, they were doing all this stuff, right? Remember they had this big investigation into that? Oh, yeah, it was all BS. By the way, he spent like $48 million on that investigation. Okay, look it up, guys. You could change your vote. In fact, when Trump was elected in 2016, there were a bunch of celebrities. I can pull up the YouTube video that a bunch of celebrities that were talking to the Republican electors from all the different states that had Trump had won, saying, please. You don't have to vote for Hillary, just don't vote for Trump. We can't have him in office. It's really, it's kind of funny to watch. It's a bunch of celebrities. So can they take bribes? Or did that break some law? That would probably break the law. Yeah, John. Can I bribe a politician? Yes. Yeah. They're not technically politicians. Yeah. <laughs> so, everybody understands how this works? Wait a second, Mr. Ebright. Wait a second. What if it's a 269 to 269 tie? That can happen. You can do those numbers in such a way, multiple ways, to get to a tie. Or let's say there's a strong third party candidate. And the third party candidate gets 100, one gets 170, and one gets 268. Who becomes president? Who decides? Not Congress, but the House of Representatives. This has happened twice. Thomas Jefferson in 1802 was elected by the House of Representatives, and John Quincy Adams in 1826 was elected by the House of Representatives. A strong third party could make this happen more often. We don't have one. 
as we'll learn about in the next section, there's a reason why we don't have a sustainable third party option. It's because the system is Well, if you don't like the two parties, change one of them that you're closest to. You got to go in and change your party. You know what I mean? Okay. Um, all right. So that's our compromise on the presidency. Yes? All right. We've got other compromises to figure out here. One is dealing with population of the states. Remember, state population determines two things. One, how much your state's going to pay in taxes. So the more people you have, the more you pay in taxes. The other is, the more people you have, the more seats you have in the House of Representatives, correct? What is the question here? Do we count slaves as population? Now, the southern states, because some of the states had already banned it, like Massachusetts already banned it, okay? Do southern states count? Do they want the slaves to count? Southern states, why? More representation in the House, more power. Willing to pay more in taxes if they get to count slaves. The northern states say, no, 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 no. You count these human beings as property, not as human beings, and they don't have human rights. So you can't count them. <laughs> well, guess what, guys? You need nine states to ratify this new constitution. Are there more than four slave states at this point? Yeah. Yeah. So guess what? You're going to need a compromise here. Now guys, this is an ugly one. This is an ugly compromise. Okay? Now, this is one of those moments when you can look back at history. And you can look at those 55 men in that room that are going to make this compromise. There are many of them that hate doing this. And we're going we're gonna to read a Federalist paper later this week, written by James Madison, about this compromise. It's painful. Now, what they're going to do, as you guys know, right? You guys know what's going to happen. There's three things. They're going to say that... For every five slaves, you get to count three of them. Now, guys, I have I abhor slavery. I think it's 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 tragic that it ever existed on this planet. Um, owning another human being to me is disgusting. That. You know, that that was something that was commonplace. Uh, and listen, there's no apology for it. it you can't apologize for it. It, it. it has too much of an impact on the human being not to recognize somebody's dignity and their humanity. Guys, what they are doing here literally is stripping a human being of two-fifths of their humanity. There used to be a saying, and it was a, it's an ugly saying, that it took five black men to do the work of three white men. And that's actually where they came up with this number. Okay. Now, listen, you have to look at the whole picture here. Guys, there is no new constitution without this compromise. Just like when they were signing the Declaration, Jefferson, when he wrote it, put some stuff in there about slavery and how wrong it was. 
and that it needed to go away. I have the deleted paragraphs in your book. You can read them. Okay. The southern states said during the Second Continental Congress, we're not signing that independence thing unless you take this out of the Declaration of Independence. Guys, there is no independence without a compromise on slavery. There is no new constitution without a compromise on slavery. It's just not going to happen. So, as Franklin said at the time, and this may be and this may be wrong. I mean, you're free to criticize these men. The issue here is not slavery. The issue is independence. The issue is a new constitution that will allow for us to do away with this in good time. And I think I quoted for you before Dr. J uh, Martin Luther King about the Declaration of Independence which he said, you know, all men are created equal. This is a promise. It's a promissory note that generations that come after us are going to have to fulfill. It's fair to criticize the fathers, the founding fathers, guys. It's fair if you want to take their names off of schools, off of monuments, off of streets. You want, you want them to go away. You don't, you know, uh, you don't want to celebrate these men. That That's up to the individual. That's up to the community that you live in. So if there's a statue of Thomas Jefferson in, in your city, and you're like, Jefferson was a slaveholder. He raped his slave and had children with her. You say rape because in, in order for consensual sex to take place, somebody should has to be able to say no. If you're a slave, can you say no? So otherwise, it would be rape. Okay, I got it. I got down a rabbit hole on Twitter yesterday. Just I didn't really comment on it. I just read about it about James Madison. This guy wrote on there how James Madison raped his slaves, and there's a whole bunch of Madisons on that side that are African American. Okay, now I've also read that James Madison grew up playing with those same slave children that were on his, on their family's plantation. Like, he grew up with them. He played with the kids, the, the slave kids. They were friends. He was free. They were not. Did Madison know it was wrong? Absolutely, he knew it was wrong. He wrote about it. Jefferson knew he was wrong. He wrote about it. Okay? Good talk. See you guys tomorrow. I'm, I'm going to be gone during the day. Don't fret. I'll be back for fifth hour. Okay?